We will go ahead and get started. Um, I am Shannon Johnson, the director of Legacy Museum and Troop County Archives, and we are excited to present our second evening with the experts of this year. Um, just kind of to break down what the uh, evening with the experts are, um, we created these programs to give our staff an opportunity to share a little bit about what we're passionate about. So um, tonight's speaker is our research archivist, Lewis Powell, and um, from my knowledge of Lewis, he has two passions. One are ghosts, and the second is uh, American Indians, Native Americans, and that is what he will focus on this evening. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Lewis to tell us about uh, the Burnt Village. Thank you, Shannon. Um, I, I kind of wanted to start this by actually saying this is one of these topics that I have discovered at the deeper I go into the topic, the less I feel like an expert on it. It, it seems that this is a topic that is, um, it, it's very broad and trying to understand the period in which this happened is um, rather difficult, but it is, utterly fascinating when you really start to dive down deep into the research. So um, our topic this evening is the destruction of Akfuskanina or re-examining the story of Burnt Village. And growing up here, I'm sure that uh, some of you may have actually heard the, uh, of Burnt Village and heard it referred to. Um, I first heard this story when I was a wee lad, and it just happened. My dad, one Saturday afternoon, decided to take me out to West Point Lake, and we went out looking for arrowheads. So after several hours of rather fruitless searching, my dad, as a consolation, decided to take me over to one of his friend's homes. And uh, this friend happened to have a large collection of arrowheads. So I was sitting there examining this collection and the friend starts talking about this place called Burnt Village. And he said it was an old Indian village that was uh, destroyed by the settlers prior to the creation of Troop County. And in my little brain, I, I had this image of this, um, of these ruins of this burned city with smoke still lingering in the ruins after all of these years. So I begged my dad to take me out there. And he takes me, he finally relents and takes me to Burnt Village Park, which um, I was rather disappointed to discover was mostly a large desolate parking lot on the side of West Point Lake. And there were no burnt ruins to be seen. So uh, even though I was rather disappointed by all of this, I kept this story in the back of my mind. And even as I grew older, I, I went to college and studied theater. And I ended up attending uh, or auditioning as part of uh, one of these large cattle call auditions for college students. And you're auditioning in front of this whole room full of uh, casting directors and uh, representatives from various summer theaters and uh, summer stock theaters and so forth. And after that audition, I ended up being cast in the outdoor historical drama Unto These Hills. And uh, the what makes Unto These Hills such a special place is the fact that this is a this is an outdoor historical drama presented in Cherokee, North Carolina. It has run every summer for um, uh, or every summer since 1950, and they utilize with the college students that they bring in as actors. They utilize a uh, cast from the local Cherokee community. So I spent uh, each of the three summers I was up there working side by side with these Cherokee people. 
And of course, I end up beginning to learn more about their culture, about Native American culture as a whole, and even about all of the problems that originally plagued Native Americans and have since plagued these people. So I became very interested in Native American culture, and I also did a deep dive into Native American history. And of course, I'm keeping the story of Burnt Village still in the back of my mind and beginning to wonder what really happened out there. So uh, going forth, I ended up um, getting hired back to Cherokee to work in their living history village. And there I had to do an even deeper dive into the research and again, kept the story of Burnt Village in the back of my mind. And so when I was hired as a staff member here, I decided, I guess now is the appropriate time to do a deep dive into the history of what happened at Burnt Village. And uh, it is very interesting that of all of the resources that have been produced on Trigg County, there is next to nothing that has really been written on the Native American uh, people who lived in, the, in this area. And so I was first disappointed and, and rather frustrated by discovering that fact. Uh, but then I picked up a copy of Clifford Smith's 1933 History of Trigg County. And this does include a uh, description of the events at Burnt Village. However, once I finished reading it, I was thoroughly disappointed to realize that this seemed like more of a Victorian adventure story. It, it was very flowery in language and was adjective laden and honestly fairly gory and really didn't appear to be a proper historical account. It, it resembled more of the script to a Hollywood summer blockbuster movie. So I, I realized that this description probably isn't very heavy on the actual facts of what happened at Burnt Village. So I decided I needed to look further. And eventually I came across uh, the fact that there were surviving newspaper articles, despite the fact that this took place in 1793, and we don't usually have many uh, papers from the 18th century as a whole, but it just happened that there were newspaper articles about the events that were published in the Augusta Chronicle. The Augusta Chronicle is the newspaper in Augusta, Georgia, that has uh, been published since the late 18th century. Uh, the first issues actually came out in 1785. And it just happens that uh, the people in Augusta have been very studious in preserving the back issues of these papers. So we actually have the original papers describing these events that happened here in what was at that point, the Georgia back country in 1793. And so we'll get to the story of exactly what happened on that fateful night uh, shortly. But first, I want to talk a little bit about what this area was like in that year. And of course, 1793 is well before the founding and establishment of Troop County. Troop County would not be uh, established until 1826. So uh, this area was just Indian land. It was occupied by the Muscogee people. And I prefer to use the term Muscogee uh, for these people rather than the more popular term Creek. Uh, the term Creek is derived from a British description of these people. And the word Muscogee is the word that they actually use to describe themselves. So it was the Muscogee people who occupied the land uh, here in the late 19th century, and of course, or late 18th century. Uh, and of course, they had probably been here for millennia. Uh, their first interactions with Europeans uh, happened in 1540, 
with uh, the Hernando de Soto expedition. While it didn't actually come through the area that would later become Troop County, it did cross near here. And the people uh, in this area probably would have seen the effects in the form of the various diseases that were transmitted by Hernando de Soto's troops to the Native American populations. And these populations were um, utterly decimated over the next uh, few decades by all of these diseases that were introduced by the Spanish. And eventually, the uh, social and political structures that existed among the, uh, the Mississippian people at that point, uh, they eventually collapsed due to all of the pressures, not only from the Spanish being on this continent, but also from all of those diseases that were spreading among them. So uh, after the social structures and political structures collapsed, these people began to reform themselves and eventually a confederacy developed amongst the various autonomous towns and uh, people living in the, uh, uh, what would become Alabama and Georgia uh, regions. And these people who were mostly culturally and linguistically related, they began to create this confederacy that would become the Muscogee Confederacy. And it would uh, control the Muscogee population all the way from the 18th century and into the early 19th century. So, of course, I've mentioned the Spanish being here and the Spanish uh, throughout the 17th century were mostly operating in Florida. But of course, the British began to arrive in the late uh, 16th century, and they began to settle Virginia, and eventually they moved south and began to settle the Carolina coast. Uh, the French would also come and uh, start settling the area that would become the Louisiana Territory. And so the Muscogee eventually found themselves in a really kind of difficult position. While they were geographically separated from the, the British and the Spanish and the French, uh, they were still located in a kind of central uh, geographic location with all of these European superpowers surrounding them. And of course, the European superpowers decided we're going to take advantage of that. And they began to send traders into the uh, Native Americans territory to trade with them and establish trading relations. The British primarily were sending traders and they were sending traders from um, uh, Charleston and later on Savannah. And these traders needed a way to get to what would, uh, or get to Indian country. So uh, they would, uh, this whole system of trails developed. And these uh, trails were the trails that would bring the traders to this area. And one of those primary trails and let me switch over to my first slide. <laughs> oh, okay. Next slide. We want to share. Oh. But this trail that developed would uh, become known as the Akfuski Trail. And I do have a map of the Akfuski Trail. Okay. Oh, here it is. All right. And uh, this was a trail that led from Augusta, Georgia, which was kind of a way station at that time for traders. And it would lead from Augusta, Georgia to the uh, great town of Akfuski in central Alabama. Akfuski was one of the major towns where there was a huge amount of trade being conducted. In fact, the British in the early 18th century would go on to construct a fort uh, right next to the town that they called Fort Akfuski. Uh, Akfuski was located 
uh, in what would become central Alabama near uh, the town of Dadeville, Alabama. And unfortunately, the site of the city and the fort are now under the waters of Lake Martin. So um, as this trail uh, progressed, it part of it did pass through what would become Southern Troop County. And you'll see there are a whole bunch of trails up here. And um, not all of these trails are the Akfuski Trail. The Akfuski Trail, despite its singular name, is actually a series of trails uh, mostly consisting of an upper trail and a lower trail, but there were all types of alternative trails involved with those as well. So this line, this dark line here, um, that is the uh, upper Fusky Trail. The lower trail would come uh, south of that. And uh, while the upper trail passed through uh, what is now Trigg County, the lower trail passed through uh, what is now Muskogee County and the Columbus, Georgia area. So all of these trails uh, eventually crossed the Chattahoochee River and they would all end up terminating at the city of Akfuski. So um, we would have in the early 18th century traders on these various trails coming through this area. And uh, oftentimes they would uh, stop off at a ford in the river. And that is where the village of Akfuskanina uh, was created. This was right at the mouth of what is now Wahadki Creek. And this is where Wahadki Creek meets the Chattahoochee. Now, there were actually several places here in Trent County where the trail uh, or travelers on the trail could ford the Chattahoochee River. And the reason there were a variety of locations is uh, each of these locations offered certain advantages depending on what kind of traveler you were. If you were a traveler solely on foot, you might cross at one area that was very easy to get across on foot, but that area, because it might be slippery, would not be ideal for someone with pack animals, especially laden pack animals. So there were other locations where people with pack animals might cross. But uh, we do know that this small village uh, did spring up at one of those fords right there on the Chattahoochee. Now, a typical uh, Muskogee village of this time, most of them were laid out in a very close fashion. If you could advance to the next slide, please. Your oh, oh, okay, thank you. So this is a drawing of a uh, typical Muskogee town that was uh, drawn by William Bartram, the, uh, the naturalist who passed, through this, who passed through this region. And uh, it shows the three main uh, structures that you would find in a Muskogee village. Uh, this round, uh, this round uh, image right here, uh, marked A, that would be the round house or the council house where the villagers would meet uh, for political discussions and uh, so forth. And then this area right next to it was, would consist of a town square. And this is where the villagers would meet for social functions. And then you'll notice there's a very large area right next to that, Mark C, and that was actually the Chunky Ground. And Chunky was a popular sport among the Native Americans. It consisted of them rolling these round rocks across the ground, and you would try to uh, hit the rocks with spears, and uh, you would also try to throw spears and see how close you could get to the rocks once they had uh, fallen on the ground. So this was a very popular game among the Native Americans, and it was widely played among the Muskogee as well. And you'll notice there are all of these structures around these three central village points, and these are all the uh, Muskogee homes. 
And from what we know from the descriptions of Akfuskanina, Akfuskanina was a fairly small town, and it probably only consisted of somewhere between 10 and maybe 50 homes. So it was not a very large town at all. Oh. All right. So um, let's talk a little bit about what happened on the evening of uh, September 21st, 1793. Now, I, I should also point out that uh, at this time, there were settlers beginning to filter into uh, Muskogee uh, land. And even though the state of Georgia stopped somewhere about middle Georgia, uh, this land had not been added to the state. It had not been uh, signed away by treaties at that point, as it would eventually would. So the, uh, there were quite a few tensions between these settlers uh, infiltrating Native American land and the Native Americans, of course, the Native Americans oftentimes would attack the settlers, the settlers would attack in return, the Native Americans would attack because of that attack, and so forth. There was a whole situation of tit for tat going on, and there were the tensions were quite high at this point. Now, the people in charge, uh, including the governor of Georgia, Edward Telfair, had mostly decided to stay out of this. They, they didn't really want to see uh, an end to these tensions. They assumed that if the, um, the settlers were to continue attacking the Native people, then the Native people would finally just decide to move away and give up their land. And so uh, Edward Telfair actually supported uh, a continuation of the, this, these tensions and the eventual violence that it caused. So on the evening of September 21st, 1793, a militia from, of all places, Greensboro, Georgia, and Greensboro, Georgia is back on the first map. Um, it, it is about 150 miles away in East Georgia. I'm not sure if it's even on this map. Actually, I believe it is. It's right about here. So here is Trent County. Uh, so we're talking about a small village 150 miles away. And prior to the 21st of September, a group of seven Indians had uh, robbed two homes in Greensboro and they had stolen several horses. Now, a few days after that, a, um, another uh, farm was robbed of horses. And this time the owners of the farm chased the uh, Indians away uh, with their horses in tow. And eventually the Indians ambushed the settlers and they ended up killing one of the horses. And uh, they also broke a gun, according to uh, the newspaper articles. Now, uh, as a result of these thefts of horses and uh, these two homes that had been broken into, uh, the militia in Greensboro decided to pursue these uh, Native American horse thieves. So they began to pursue them along the Akfuski Trail. And at some point along the Akfuski, they ended up stopping and they stopped at the ford over the Chattahoochee River near the village of Akfuskanina. Now, one of the articles that was published in the paper is uh, a letter that was written by Lieutenant William Felton, uh, or Lieutenant Melton. And Melton was one of the leaders of the militia from Greensboro. And he describes the attack. Um, they arrived uh, at the Chattahoochee River uh, where they arrived about two o'clock in the morning. The crowing of cocks indicated that some town was near. Major Adams and William Hill voluntarily went in search of a, 40, of a 
hurting uh, in search of a fording place. And after considerable time, Major Adams discovered a place about 500 yards wide, which he crossed, went into town, listened at the huts, and heard the Indians asleep, upon which he returned, took his horse in his hand, and led the way across the river, followed by all of the party. This was about half an hour before day, and about 15 minutes after daybreak, uh, proceeded to charge the town. The disposition was as follows. Colonel Alexander was put in charge of some houses opposite the ford. Colonel Captain Melton was detached to some houses above the ford, and Colonel Lamar, being on my left, charged together. Colonel Lamar, meeting an Indian uh, who raised the death hallow so that... Um, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped a sentence. Uh, Colonel Lamar, meeting an Indian, fired upon him, which alarmed the Indians who raised the death hallow uh, so that four were only killed in the town and eight women and children taken prisoner. About 50 or 60 huts were burnt in which a considerable quantity of property with about 250 uh, bushels of corn must have been destroyed. And then it goes on to describe that uh, the soldiers pursued uh, several more uh, Native American warriors out of the village, and they eventually killed two of those warriors. At that point, they then decided to return to Greensboro victorious. Now, after this was published in the uh, Augusta Chronicle, uh, this was published about a month after the actual events, a letter also appeared in the same issue of the Augusta Chronicle. And this letter was written by James Seagrove. James Seagrove had been appointed an Indian agent by the federal government. And he had uh, been a merchant in St. Mary's, Georgia. And while he spent time in St. Mary's, he had developed a trading relationship with not only the Spanish in Florida, but also many of the Native Americans living in South Georgia. So it was because of that that he was appointed a, uh, an Indian agent. So in the same issue, he is writing a letter addressed to the governor of Georgia. And he says, dear sir, the duty I owe my country and regard for my reputation obliges me once more to address your excellency on a subject to me that to me is truly unpleasant. By my communications to you, you have been fully informed of my intended journey into the Creek Nation, as well as the nature and extent of my business. And he goes on to explain that he has been working to make peace with the Muscogee people and that he was hoping to journey into Muscogee territory in hopes of uh, making this peace. However, he says, I was not a little astonished when on the morning of the ninth, being then about 32 miles from this place, he is riding from uh, Fort Phidias on the uh, Mulgi River, um, I was met by Captain Dickinson with a party of federal troops who, it appeared, had been dispatched in consequence of a council of all the officers at this garrison, held from the repeated alarming accounts uh, to them that parties of people were out on the road in order to intercept and destroy me. Those misguided people, having heard that I was going to the Indian nation in order to make peace for this country. He then goes on to say, uh, but all doubts on this head were soon removed by the expedition which was sent out from this frontier under command of, of Colonels Lamar, Alexander, and Melton, who crossed the Oconee on or about the 15th, and on the 21st, surprised a small town on the Chattahoochee River called the Little Akfuskies, which town was under the direction of the white lieutenant, who it is well known to have ever been friendly to this country. 
I am informed by one of the captains that was on the expedition that the party before mentioned killed and scalped six Indian men and brought off eight female prisoners, plundered and burned the town, which consisted of about 10 houses. Very interesting. Uh, comparing this to Lieutenant Melton's description, which described the villages having uh, between 60 and 70 homes. So uh, James Seagrove only describes it as consisting of 10 houses. And then uh, after they destroyed the, uh, the town, the party returned to Greensboro with the prisoners and the plunder. So then after he uh, describes uh, these events, he goes on to say that he is beginning to fear for his life and that His Excellency the Governor has uh, sent out information against him and against his work in the uh, Native American lands uh, towards peace and has stirred up many of the uh, locals against him. He goes on to say, and this is one of my favorite passages, at the same time, I had received uh, undoubted information of two other parties of horse being out on the Indian territory from this frontier, all of them with the avowed intention of opposing my meeting the Indians or affecting a peace. To these things, I am sorry to add that a torrent of unmerited calumny and insolent threats are denounced against me by many of the people of this country, and no pains taken by His uh, Excellency, the Executive of Georgia, to support a federal officer in the fateful discharge of his duty. And it goes on to sign off as in was custom here in the 18th century. Uh, he does, however, make a demand before he signs off. I continue here in order to receive advice from the nation and to act eventually. In the meantime, I have, a, I have to request that your excellency will order that the eight female prisoners taken on the 12th of September from Little Akfuski town be sent to me at this place where they shall be taken care of and returned in exchange for any prisoners of the United States in the Creek Nation. You will please excuse my intruding so long on your time and believe me to be your excellency's obedient, very humble servant, James Seagrove. And it is very interesting to imagine Mr. Seagrove probably writing this letter by candlelight. And I uh, imagine that he probably just wanted to spit. He was so angry. So in the very next column in the newspaper is a reply from His Excellency, the governor. And this very simply says in a very curt manner, on a letter of the third instant from James Seagrove, Esquire, Superintendent of the Creek Nation, it is ordered that the said James Seagrove be notified that it is inconsistent with the dignity and safety of the state to deliver up and sur or surrender to his charge the Creek prisoners now in Augusta. Signed, William Urquhart, Secretary to His Excellency, the Governor of Georgia. So these tensions, which had previously existed uh, before the attack on Akbuskanina, were certainly exacerbated by this attack. James Seagrove, in fearing for his life, actually ended up escaping and hiding in a swamp for some time, uh, worried that these people were out to see him dead, basically on the bad information from the governor of Georgia. Eventually, he did return and uh, continued his position as an Indian agent for the federal government. And eventually, he would be replaced by a man named Benjamin Hawkins. Benjamin Hawkins would later become very well known as quite a friend of the Muscogee people, but he served as an excellent intermediary between both the settlers who were still continuing to move into the territory and the Muscogee people uh, that he was overseeing for the federal government.
Now, eventually, Benjamin Hawkins did pass through this area, and he happened to remember the events that took place at Akfuskanina. And he actually writes in his journals of his travels that uh, he passed by this place, which he describes as uh, Akfuskanini. And then he noted that the remains of uh, many of the homes were still visible. And he also noted that there were peach trees, some plum, locust, and Casina Yapan bushes. And Casina Yapan, that is uh, the holly from which the Native Americans made their black drink. It is, in fact, the only uh, plant that grows in North America that can actually provide caffeine. So this was essentially a form of Native American coffee. So it is very interesting that he points out the fact that there are these uh, charred remains remaining of the village uh, in 1798. And over time, this story kind of passes into legend. And that area uh, is still, or part of that area of Troop County, is still known as the Burnt Village. Uh, the area would eventually uh, become part of Lake West Point when the uh, lake was impounded by the West Point Dam. But in the years leading up to the impoundment, the University of Georgia sent an archaeologist out to do uh, several excavations at that site. And uh, it is through his reports that we are beginning to understand kind of the layout of the village. He uncovered uh, evidence of a number of homes on that site, uh, but he also did uncover uh, the remains of several Native Americans that had been buried there as well. So um, let's see, we, we moved on from the Augusta Chronicle. Here is Governor Telfair. And these are several photographs of the excavations at Burnt Village. Uh, this shows uh, just part of the excavation. We can, oh, and here is the archaeologist with a, a young boy uh, digging up something. And then this, this is one of the uh, uh, Native American graves that was discovered at that site. And of course, like I said, that site is now under the waters of Lake West Point. Uh, there is, however, a historic marker that is um, about um, a thousand yards, as it says in the opening sentence, from the original site. This is out at one of the uh, Corps of Engineers parks right next to the lake. And uh, the last time I visited this marker, which was back in 2015, uh, the marker had actually uh, been gone for quite some time. And the only thing out there is uh, the concrete post that the marker once sat upon. So uh, this is a story that is very instrumental in the, uh, the earliest history of this county and the formation of the county. But sadly, all that remains, like the sign, is just a bare post. So any comments, questions, or concerns before I call this meeting to an end? So do we have any comments or questions from Facebook? We're looking, a lot of people are saying it's a great topic, and hello, Philip Wyatt's and hello. Oh. No questions. All right. Well, thank you very much. and. Uh, if you have any questions for me afterwards, I'll hang around for a few minutes. So thank you very much. Yes. Uh, yes, I do. I can go grab we, it from my office and make a copy. We would like to say thank you to everybody that's on Facebook. Um, Thank you for being patient with our few technical difficulties as well. If you do have questions, feel free to give it, send okay. us an email um, or ask on our Facebook account. Okay. Um, in the in the impending months between now and our next um, 
um, evening with the experts. Our next one won't be until November. We do have some more lectures, um, High Noon History. The next one will be May 3rd that we would love for you guys to come out for um, to the square in the middle of town and uh, enjoy lunch with us and enjoy another lecture. So thank you again for being here and we will see you next time.